What's up? Welcome in. Hogue and Johns with you. Thursday edition of the show. Getting ready for the first preseason game. The Tennessee Titans coming to Soldier Field. How many catches is DeAndre Hopkins going to have? Over under 0.5. I was going to say one and a half. I'm going to say zero. Is he even going to play? I don't know. DJ Moore? I mean, if Justin Fields is playing, you got to play DJ Moore for three, four snaps. I don't, he's like the one one guy on the roster I think you could justify not playing at all. I, I, I might give you that. I like we've already that. seen the chemistry in camp. I think I don't think it hurts to throw him out there and try to keep the offense cohesive. But it, I, you know what? Let's circle around to some of that at the end of this uh, as we sort of preview the game. Uh, it's going to be fun. But we have a special guest on the show today. Jason McKee, the Bears' new sideline reporter, is jumping on with us. Looking forward to talking to him. Make sure you're following us on Twitter, at Adam Hogue, at Adam Johns. All the coverage all week long on The Athletic, theathletic.com slash Hogan Johns. Get Johnsy's coverage, Fish Banes. Saw Dan Pompey at practice the other day. So all the coverage is there for you on The Athletic. And, of course, on CHGO, we have daily practice recap shows, usually at 3 o'clock. Uh, if you're listening to this on Thursday, we're actually at 4 o'clock today. Um, and all of that stuff is on the CHGO YouTube channel. So check it out. Hit subscribe. Hit the like button on this video as well. And if you're not subscribed on our YouTube channel, you should be as well. Hogan Johns on YouTube. Appreciate it. Everybody who consumes the podcast that way, as well as the old school way for listening on Spotify, Apple, however you listen to the podcast, please rate and review. We appreciate it. Most importantly, we always say, just send it to a friend, somebody you know who's a Bears fan. Say, hey, check us out. It's a great pod. And we always appreciate you guys helping us grow the show. Um, well, we are deep into football season. It's been fun having Jason McKee out at practices uh, this year. Uh, especially because I coach high school football with them and we can sit there and watch a, you know, a pro practice together. But I know you've been spending some time watching a bunch practice with them and, and, you know, having his knowledge has been uh, a great boost. I know to us just watching practices as well. Uh, and I thought with the first game that he's going to be on the sidelines now is the new sideline reporter for the, Chicago Bears radio broadcast team, Jeff Joniak, Tom Thayer, Jason McKee now as they move over to ESPN 1000. Thought it'd be a good time to bring him on the show. Uh, and of course, he's also the head coach at Carmel Catholic High School. We started practices this week. So it's been a it's a busy couple weeks here, John. As you know as well, you're coaching youth football. Love it. So we go for it's a great Bears. time of year. It's it's awesome. So uh might as well jump into this conversation with Jason at jmac37 on Twitter. Good follow there as well. Here he is, former amazing Bears fullback, special teamer, now sideline reporter, Jason McKee. All right, let's bring in the new sideline reporter, analyst. Not sure what we should call you, jmac, but the newest member of the Bears radio Broadcast team, which I feel like some fans don't even realize moved to ESPN 1000 this year. And the first game is uh, is Saturday, obviously, with the preseason opener. What's up, J-Mac? What's going on, fellas? Thanks for having me on. Uh, yeah, Hogue, I, um, you know, first game, obviously, Saturday, preseason. Um, a lot at stake for the guys that's on the, on the bubble in terms of making the roster. So I'm always excited to see those guys play. I was in their cleats uh, at a, I mean, a long time ago. So, you know, I know what it takes. I know, you know, the amount of pressure that they're facing, um, a lot of excitement, a lot of nerves at this time, uh, knowing that they have to go out there and, and, and state their case every single day. You know, every training camp practice, every meeting, everything's an evaluation. But the ultimate evaluation is how you play in the preseason. But as we all know, is is now analysts and reporters and, and things of that nature. It's, it's not just how you perform for, you know, the Bears. It's how you perform for the other teams around the league because, you know, all these scouting departments do a good job of, you know, trying to make sure they can find guys or find hidden gems that they can bring and add to their roster to make it better. So a lot of opportunity for a lot of guys. But as we know, there's only so many spots. J-Mac, I've enjoyed standing next to you on the on the sideline and even learning more football from you as it happens. But I got to ask you, like, as someone who is in, in, in Bourbon A, like, what do you think of training camp? At Hallis Hall, the, the intensity, the, the whole environment. What do you think? 
Um, I've been saying it the whole time, and I know people's probably tired of hearing me say it. And it's like I don't know if I'm complaining, just you know, stating how it was for us in Bourbon A having uh, two a day practices, obviously full padded practices, and being in the dorm, you know, being far away, being you know away from your family, uh, a real training camp experience uh, that I like to call it. But you know what? I think it's set up great for the players right now. Um, obviously they're looking at the longevity of players, looking at players' health, uh, trying to make sure they're fresh. So. You know, the new format, three days of practice, one day off is, is something that I would have loved to have been a part of. You know, obviously my time was before they, they established this, but I think it's good for the players. You know, the only thing that I worry about is the lack of uh, uh, physicality in terms of, you know, hitting. Obviously, you know, you're not really going to tackle to the ground and stuff like that. Uh, will the guys' bodies be calloused or will they be ready uh, for the season opener? So, I think it's a catch-22. You want to make sure your guys are fresh and healthy, but at the same time, as, as athletes and players, we want to make sure that that our body's prepared uh, to go through the rigors of a full NFL season. Yeah, Hulk and I were on the sideline, was it yesterday, Adam, where we were like, I don't think I've seen a live, fully live tackling period they yet. They haven't done it yet, no. So, so yeah. what does that, like, does that mean you can play your starters a bit more in the, in the preseason so, so they get some of that? Yeah, the funny thing is I was talking to – I think I was talking to Grody about that um, yesterday, and I was telling him how, you know, even back when we were in Bourbon A, there were some periods in which, you know, Levy would tell us beforehand, but there were some periods where he would say, you know what, we're going to go ones versus ones, and it's going to be goal line, and it's going to be five plays of all live, tackling to the ground and everything. And that just elevated the intensity, that and elevated the competitiveness. But, you know, like we're saying, it just helped get us ready uh, you know, especially as backs. I can go in there and, and block full speed as a fullback. You know, the running backs can go in there and they know they're going to get tackled full speed, something that's going to happen here in a few weeks. So in terms of, um, you know, the preseason, I, you know, I I think that's why, you know, um, Eva Foose came out and said that, you know, Justin's going to start. Some of the starters will, st- will still start because he wants to see them in live action. Um, it's one thing for us to analyze Justin Fields and say, you know, he's developed – He's mature. He's, he's been able to manipulate the pocket. He's grown in his offense. We haven't seen a live rush at him. You know, in practice, it's a tempered rush. That defensive line knows that they get near that quarterback, they, they better veer off and not hit the quarterback. So a lot of those things in terms of true evaluations of quarterback and certain players, you can't get until, they, until they're in some type of live action. Jay mac I want to get into some of uh, things you've seen some from some of the players so far in practice, but – but first, I want to go back to your playing career a little bit because if there's somebody who could definitely appreciate this preseason grind and what some of these guys that are going to be playing in the third, fourth quarter Saturday and, and how important those reps are, it's you because you went through this from starting with the Eagles to getting waived, to being on practice squads, to going to Dallas briefly and then getting claimed by the Bears eventually. What do you remember from that time and I guess your first couple preseasons where you really had to prove yourself in those games before you were ever really allowed to be an actual, uh, you know, starting NFL player. Yeah. You know, you're a, you're a young guy, you come in and obviously I was an undrafted guy and you have to treat every day, not just the games, but practice like the Super Bowl. You know, you're literally, you're literally fighting for your, for your football lives. And the reality is in this game, a lot of these guys on this roster that don't make this team, this will be the last time they ever play football because some of these guys won't get on a practice squad. Some of these guys won't make a roster. Um, even back when I played, it was only a five-man practice squad, so it was real competitive. Um, even make my, my rookie year, I, I can recall being in Philly and uh, making that practice squad, and they cut guy, a guy who got drafted in the sixth round. They cut a guy that got drafted in the seventh round and kept you know a couple of us undrafted guys on their, on their uh, practice squad, and, and three out of the five of us went on to have long NFL careers. And one of them was my buddy Steve Edwards, who we know played here in Chicago. Yeah. And another one was Artis Hicks, who played for the Eagles for a long time. And, you know, you have to approach every day like it could be your last day of football. You know, you're I can recall going into the locker room and, you know, walking in and, and having my locker and my locker mate next to me, his name tags on it, everything's removed. Like it's that quick. So, you know, making the most of every opportunity, especially in the game. Uh, You know, for the young guys, as we know, the main thing is special teams. You know, we talk about it all the time. But if you really want to make a roster, you got to be a four phase special teams guy, first and foremost, because your first couple of years in the league, if you're a a lower ended guy in terms of being undrafted or you're drafted in the lower rounds, like you're going to be a special teams player. And when you start making plays on special teams and they and the coaches can trust you, 
then you can earn, you know, an opportunity to play your <laughs> regular position, you know, whatever your position is. So it, it's a lot that goes into it. It's a lot of pressure. But at the same time, you've got to make sure that you're prepared to go out there mentally and physically to put on a good show each and every day. So that way your evaluation comes. It's a good evaluation uh, by the coaches and scouts on a daily basis. See, Hey, Johnsy, real quick. See, everyone remembers J-Mac played under Dave Tobe in Chicago on those great special teams units. But do you remember you or do you? Have any idea who his special teams coordinator would have been when he was with Philly? Who? John Harbaugh. Harbaugh. Really? Yeah, okay. man. Yeah, I think I knew that actually. Yeah. yeah. And, so, and the funny thing, that's how you know, that's how I originally like opened up eyes in, in Eagles camp was on special teams. And you know, a couple stories, like obviously, like to uh, like Hogue said, uh Coach Harbaugh was the head special teams coach, Dave Tobe was the assistant. So it was, it was, you know, I made sure that I was, I fought to be on every single phase of special teams. Um, you know, I, I caught the eye of uh, Coach Harbaugh, who, uh, you know, was obviously a great coach, redhead coach right now with the Ravens and Tobe. After practice, I would stay and do extra drills with Tobe. And it just meant that much to me. You know, I wanted to be a dog on special teams. And I can recall uh, being on punt return and uh, I was the end. And, and they even had, you know, Tobe had some of their starters on punt. And, during special teams practice, I remember Brian Dawkins was was uh, he was the left slot on punt, and I was the uh, the right end, and I would come off and I would hold him up every time like full speed, and and some of the guys were like easy easy that's Brian Dawkins easy easy, and uh, B Doc at the practice said you know what J Mac don't take it easy on me because you're trying to get where these guys are, you know what I mean these guys some of these guys they're vets and they think they can take it day off because they feel like they're established, but reality is some of these vets who think they're going to be here won't be here so. You keep coming hard. Don't worry. I'm, you keep giving me a good look because you're trying to make a mark for yourself. yourself. You're trying to get here. So you know, that's some that's some knowledge and things that was passed down from some of the great vets that we had in Philly. And that's some of the knowledge and, and things that I kept with me my entire career. So when like a special teams period comes up and we joke about it in, in the media, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's a time for bathroom break. Go find a water. You know, <laughs> this is Adam Hoax time, right? You know, you know he's, he's, they're taking like endless <laughs> notes because the special teams units are out there. But in, in all like seriousness, like if you're watching practice, it's like what are you looking for in terms of a player where, where you know like that guy's embracing this opportunity like on special teams? Like he may have a chance. He may be like the third or fourth string linebacker, but man, is he flying around in special teams? Like, what are you looking for? Yeah, and, and, and a lot of it's controlled now. So whatever phase is controlled, and I think, uh, you know, me and, me and Ho talk about it a lot. I like the way Coach uh, Hightower breaks up, you know, especially kickoff attorney, breaks up the front line from the back end. He, he separates and they work on fundamentals and he brings it all together. So what I look at is the guys doing those fundamental drills. Are they attacking that drill full speed? Yeah, it's controlled. Yeah, it may, may not be able to block you know, you're you're uh, the opposing guy full speed. But at the same time, if you're going full speed and you're really locked in on the fundamentals of whatever phase you're working on, that's what I look at because they're taking it seriously. I think they have a better understanding of, of what it's going to take to make a roster. You'll see some guys and it's sad. You see some rookies. They're nonchalant about it. You know, they'll make their drop on kickoff return and, you know, they're jogging, trying to make their block. And and those are the guys that that, that won't be here because in order to to excel, on special teams, and especially to have a good showing in the preseason, you've got to try to master the fundamentals with the limited amount of reps that you're going to get. So if you're not practicing those fundamentals full speed in practice, well, how are you going to have a good showing and how are you going to be able to execute your job, you know, on the field in preseason? So those are some things that I never took for granted. I wanted to excel at every rep. I was the guy asking a lot of questions. I was the guy answering all the questions. Whenever there was a question asked, I was the first one to raise my hand and answer it because you know, I wanted to show that I was engaged. I wanted to show that it meant something. So a lot of guys look at me and roll their eyes like, oh, the key's going to answer it again. I say, yeah, I'm going to answer it. You guys keep sitting back. I'm going to answer it. But I'm also going to have a good showing when I'm out throwing the field. Yeah, I'm going to have a job. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I'm trying to play football, man. I, You know, this is my dream. So if it's, if it's your dream and you say that, you know, football is your life, well, then why not approach it and attack everything in that way? It doesn't make sense for the guys who don't do it. J Mac, you've been at most of the practices. Uh, what are what are your first impressions right now with Justin Fields and the offense? And w what are you really keen on and hoping to see in whatever limited reps they get on Saturday? Yeah, just just from my observations at practice, you know, obviously the growth in terms of the offense as a whole, uh, there's a better understanding by players. You can see that just by the way 
uh, Getsy has been utilizing a lot of shifts, a lot of personnel groupings, a lot of motions. Uh, something that, you know, last year, yeah, he still used some of that, but not as much just because guys were still new in the offense. Um, so it's good to see the growth in, from that standpoint. Um, it's good to see the growth from the players. Um, you know, I think a lot of the guys have developed and they're actually playing faster because they have a feel for the system. Uh, you know, prime example, Chase Claypool, he's been playing fast. He's been making plays. And I think that it's just because he has an understanding of practice. And, you know, I think uh, Coach Eberflus talked about that yesterday. You know, the thing that he's seen from, from Chase Claypool is just, one, being able to line up, knowing what he's doing, so therefore he's able to play fast and use his ability to make plays. So uh, those are some of the things. You know, Justin, I think he's – um, I see he's gotten smarter uh, in certain situations. You know, I think he's taking uh, a lot of things he's doing. He's taking what the defense gives him. A lot of times we see him dumping the ball down on the check down. Uh, that shows growth um, in, in that aspect. So I'm just excited to see the continued growth, uh, you know, from this offense. But, you know, during preseason, I think it just goes back to, uh, you know, what the coaches have been echoing all along. They want to see how uh, the offense operates. You know, how can Justin Fields operate the offense? You know, can he get the guys in and out of the huddle? Can he make the checks at the line of scrimmage in terms of protection? You know, can he make sure he gets the ball out to the right read? Can he get the ball out in time? Is he in rhythm? You know, things of that nature. So, you know, especially the guys who, you know, the young guys who we really need to see who have a chance of, of making the roster. Uh, you know, Bayless Jones, we got to see the rookie Tyler Scott. What can he do in live action? Uh, some of those other young receivers, some of these running backs are going to get an opportunity. So it's going to be an opportunity for us as analysts to actually get a, you know, somewhat – uh, we'll just start to have a true evaluation of what we've been seeing in training camp. How about his, his connection with uh, DJ Moore? Like, how do you see that maybe benefiting him right now in camp? And then what's the next step maybe that you want to see? Maybe be beyond, like, like, well, I guess the next step is the, the real games and whatnot. Yeah. But, like, what does that do for an offense when you have that type of connection working the way it seems to be right now? Yeah, obviously you can see the chemistry there. Those guys have spent some time together in the offseason, so they've worked on it. You can see they have a feel for each other. Um, I think it's evident that Justin Fields has a real feel for how DJ Moore is going to run his routes. Uh, so I'm glad to see that connection. Um, but overall, just like you said, you know, all the flashes and all the big plays that we've seen DJ Moore make in training camp, he's made these plays in game situations already, but it's just going to be good for us to see him make it in a Bears uniform now. So that's what I want to see moving forward. Um, you know, DJ Moore is a, is a Philly guy and I went to Temple University. So a, a lot of people from the Philly area, they, they text me every day. Hey, tell DJ this, tell DJ that. And, and one of my closest friends who's from Philly uh, texted me this morning. He said, man, he said, you know, everybody's making a fuss about DJ Moore. He's like the crazy thing is he's been like this since he's tw since he was 12 years old. So, you know, he's always been a playmaker. You know, he's always had the ability that, that he's had. And, you know, it's just going to be good to see him you know, go out there and be productive, you know, and live up to the hype that he's had since he's arrived here. Jay Mack, have you been able to see enough at the line of scrimmage so far? I'm specifically thinking about the rookies like Darnell Wright and then on the other side of the ball, Javon Dexter, Zach Pickens, any first impressions there? And then I think obviously that's probably the best part of Saturday's actual preseason game is getting to see these guys go live in the trenches. Yeah, 100%. You know, I just see – I'll start with on the offensive side with Darnell Wright. Just, you know – when, when you see him in person, like, you know, he's a big guy on paper, but it's one thing to see, you know, a guy's height and weight lifted on paper. And then it's another thing to see him in person. Like, the guy, the guy, dude's big. Like, he's huge. I mean, he's got long arms. He's solid. Uh, so it, it's good to see him in practice. You know, obviously, now when they do one-on-ones uh, against the defensive line, that's still a controlled rush, so to speak. But it's good to see that he does have the tools to be a successful right tackle in his league for a long time. So it's just going to be good to see him do it against – uh, a, a, a live rush, you know, against a, a, a live rush against an NFL caliber defensive end that's not con controlled at a practice tempo. And uh, for those those young guys, the defensive tackles, Javon Dexter and Zach Pickens, I think you know, those are some big guys too. Um, they're strong guys. Uh, it's been good to see their get off. And, you know, I know Javon's been working at, on his get off and his stance and, and, and those things like that. So it's just going to be good to see those guys in live action because a lot of times, too, with the defensive line, like we talked about, it's a tempo rush. So, you know, you're seeing glimpses of what they can do, but I still think us as analysts and, and as observers, we don't really know what they can do because they're not able to go full speed 100%. You know what I'm saying? They can't come off the ball and shed that guard and throw them down on the ground because we don't want to get people hurt. So those are some of the questions that will begin to be answered on Saturday. 
as a former fullback, what do you make of well, well the run game? I, I think they got – it's going to work again, but I'm not sure who's going to be, uh, well, the leading ball carrier, uh, to, to be honest. I don't even think they even need one, but what do you think of the run game so far in that backfield? Yeah, the scheme – I'll start with the scheme. I love the scheme. I mean, the scheme's similar to, you know, to – well, can't say too much because you're a Notre Dame guy, but I like it. I like it. <laughs> Those questions are coming later, and I'm this right, is being recorded. So you know, you're over there taking notes. <laughs> but I, I love the scheme. I love the scheme, um, and I love the versatility. You know, you see in the run game, you see get season 12 personnel, 21 personnel. It would be an 11 personnel. And you've got a lot of backs in that backfield, a lot of young backs that have a lot of promise. So I'm excited um, to see, you know, how far they can take this. I think they have – I think the whole running back room is really good. You know, all the way down. You see Tristan Ebner making some big runs yesterday in practice. So, you know, he's trying to stay the case for this roster. Um, obviously, Rashawn Johnson's the physical back. And, you know, for me, just watching Rashawn Johnson, it's like you know, he was a quarterback in high school, you know, one of the top quarterbacks. And then obviously he went to Texas and they moved him to running back. And just to see, like, he just looks like a natural, like he's been doing it for years. You know what I'm saying? In, in terms of his physicality as well, because – when you have quarterbacks, you don't think they would be as physical as he is running the ball or as aggressive as he is in pass protection. So I'm ex- really excited to see him play. Um, I think Deontay Foreman is another really good back who's made the most of his opportunities when he's been given. We saw that last year when he was in Carolina. And it's a great opportunity for Khalil Herbert to, to be that lead guy. So a lot of competition in that room. Um, so I'm just excited to see the guys in, in live action and see – you know what type, what they can bring to this offense, and you could tell they're looking forward to like finishing some of their runs. Oh, yeah, like yeah. I think it was Johnson had one at the goal line yesterday, where like you know he's scoring. Yeah, but Eberflus, you know, wanted to make it tough on the offense, called yeah. him down at the the two, even though it's just like a hand tackle. And for an offense that prides itself on physicality, you know they're they're, yeah. they're being called down quite fast. Uh, you know, yeah. by, by you the see- officials there. You see, but the thing we talk about, like, you know, Coach Ibrifu, we talk about, he talks about the hits principle and all this stuff. And and I think a lot of people just associate that with the defense. And, you know, to your point, Adam, when you see Rashawn on that carry yesterday and he's driving his legs to the goal line, you see the whole entire offense line run over to him and they're all pushing him towards the goal line. You know what I mean? That's a part of his principle. That's playing fast as an offense. You know what I mean? Like, those are the things, like, those are a lot of things that we did as an offense. Like, when our – when the running back got tackled, the entire offensive line, myself included, we're all running over to the back around him, pushing the pile, making sure we pick him up. You know what I'm saying? Making our presence be felt play after play. Letting the, letting the defense know, hey, guys, we're here. Yeah, we're here. We're going to be here all day. It's going to be a physical game. So I like to see that because that's what you want to see in terms of the culture building, the standard, the expectation. So we know that it's not just coach speak and we just know that that's not being implemented on the defensive side of the ball It's being implemented on, at, on, as a whole in terms of the team. Well, you get to be back on the, on the, on the, the NFL sidelines on Saturday. Uh, what are you most excited for? It's obviously a much different role than playing, but what are you most excited for in this uh, new opportunity you have on the bears broadcast? Yeah. I mean, first I'm just excited to get started. Uh, I mean, I've been, been practicing and, doing all kinds of things. I probably have about 50, 50 made up sideline recordings on my tape recorder. Uh, you know, I've been, I've been studying like I'm going to play in a game. It's learning personnel, learning name pronunciation. Uh, shout out to Hope for helping with some of those names uh, yesterday. So I came home from our practice, Hope, and I'm sitting here just, uh, just saying names and my wife's looking at me like I'm crazy. I'm like, hey, I got to get it down. I got to get it down. So, you know, when, when you, when you're a professional athlete and, and you have that drive, like you're, like that doesn't stop just because you're not playing the game. That drive is evident in everything you do. You know, it's evident with me as a high school coach. It's evident with it's going to be evident with me in this new role. Like when you're a professional and you're at the, at the top of your game, you just have a drive to be great in everything you do. And you know that's what I'm trying to do. Just make sure that you know, I give um, I give the, the the Bears fans you know something to listen to. That way, I'm an extra eye out there on the sideline and. You know, if I see something in, in terms of that they might not see up in the booth in terms of Jeff and Tom, then I'm going to give my view on it and, and give my opinion on it. So I'm really excited. Thanks for the opportunity as well. And just ready to get started, ready to see some live football. Has Ho given you any tips for the first, you know, minus five degrees game where you got to have like five layers of clothing? <laughs> we haven't there gotten and... there yet, but yeah, those, those are rough. 
Yeah, I mean, when you play in it, it's it's you know it's it's different. Obviously, I've been in those elements, and I'm moving around as a player, so I'm gonna be a little bit warm. But you know, I, I've got I'm geared up. I'll be out there looking like a polar bear in in my snowsuit, ski suit. You know what I mean? I may have on some ski goggles or something like that. So I'll be ready. You know, I, I'm excited. Uh, I'll probably I probably have to uh, put Joniak in a headlock after the game since they're gonna be up in the booth. You know. <laughs> There's a little bit taller, so he's taller than me, so I'm going to have to jump up and put him in the headlock after the game for me being jealous of those guys being warm in the booth. But I'm excited, man. Anytime I'm around the game of football and any opportunity that I have to grow the game, you know, it's it's it's, an, it's excitement for me. I think you should put Joniak in a headlock regardless. <laughs> just, 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 be, just because. Um, all right, October 13th, Notre Dame, Carmel. What's the bet, fellas? What do we got? Give them, Give me a preview. You guys got to come up here. So, you know, we we went down to Notre Dame a few years back, and you guys beat us pretty bad. We were young. We were a young team. Um, we had a lot of guys playing in that game that were freshmen and sophomores. So those kids are now juniors and seniors, played a lot of football, um, had a lot of success already. Um, so I'm, I'm excited. You know, anytime high school football around here, especially in the Catholic League, is really high-level football, a lot of high-level coaches. Great players, um, you know, getting opportunities. There's a lot of kids getting offers and scholarships in this league. So just excited to be a part of it. You know, just excited at the competition. Um, so it'll be a good game. Hope to see you there, Johns. Uh, obviously, I'm going to make sure they charge you extra at the gate. But <laughs> yeah. hope you're there. I can't use a press pass to get out of the sideline. <laughs> no, I'm going to tell them, hey. Other side of the field. Yeah, you're going to be way on the other side of the field. Host. Now, when I played at Notre Dame, we played Carmel. They were in the old triple option where everybody had, like, you know, responsibility. I was a cornerback, so I was always watching the pitch man. What scheme are, are you guys running? You know, what? Uh, yeah, see, no. <laughs> what, what no. Hey, you know what the scheme's called? Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, had to, I tried. I tried. <laughs> For our listeners, before we went live here, I had to catch myself because we immediately started going into our practice plan for today, and then we forgot we had a Notre Dame spy on the call. Yeah, you know, John's Only recording from the start. Yeah. You know, he's a great note taker, man. He's at practice all the time. He's got his, he's got his sheet. He's writing down notes, so you know he took some notes on that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I know it's not it's not quite the two a days you went through as a player, but you know we're kind of in the two a days right now. We got Bears camp in the morning. Carmel uh, Johns is coaching uh, seventh eighth grade football too, so yeah, he's out there on the practice field. It's great. It's football season again. I love it. Yeah, Absolutely yeah, man. love it. It's, uh, it's a lot of work, but you know what? It, it's it, it's a blessing to be able to be in a situation to where, like, even for us, I mean, like we're you know we we go to. Chicago Bears practice and we get to be on the sideline we get to watch the guys we get to meet the guys you know what I mean we get to you know be be eyes and ears for 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 the Bears fans and then you know all of us get to go off and and help grow the game coaching youth football high school football so it's just a blessing to be in this situation um you know something that I, I never take anything for granted but you know at the end of the day you know my my goal was when I retired was to be a blessing to others and if I can do that through the game of football then it's even better how much do you think certain drills or, or, or just certain messages maybe transcend the sport, you know, all the way from youth football to the pros? Because I, I think like we were doing a drill yesterday that I know I know the Bears do. You know, I'm coaching seventh, eighth grade, you know, defensive yeah. backs. And, and I know the Bears do this drill. And I think I know it's a lot of fundamentals. But for someone who coaches high school football, high, like if you're not if you're not familiar with the the Catholic League, if if you're from like Ireland and watching right now, like the Catholic League is like the yeah. premier football conference mm -hmm. in the Chicago area. Toughest teams, D1 players on like every team. Um, like how much transcends like from from youth football all the way to the top, J Mac? Yeah, a lot of it does. I mean, when you look at football, right? What is football? It's just blocking, tackling, and catching. You know what I'm saying? You add the scheme, you add the scheme to it, but you gotta have guys that can do those three core things. So at a young age, you know, we're teaching kids proper tackling techniques, right? We're teaching kids how to, how to catch. We're teaching kids how to get in their stance. We're teaching kids how to block. All of that transcends. And you see the same drill, like you said, uh, John, it's the same drills that that you're doing, that, that me and Ho's doing at Carmel. It's the same thing that the Bears are doing. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't change. And the fundamentals is the foundation of anything, especially in the game of football. You're always going to work on those things. And what I tell people is, they asked me, well, what is it like playing in the NFL? I said, well, the difference is what makes you a pro is, right, a couple things. It's being able to make the routine play no matter what, no matter what the temperature is outside, no matter if you get in an argument at home, no matter how you're feeling that day, 
is being able to make that routine play when your number's called, but it's also making the big play at any given at any, any given moment, you know what I mean? And being able to limit the amount of mistakes that you make. It's just mastering your craft, you know what I'm saying? So that that's what makes you a pro, and those fundamentals are something that you'll work on. You know, you have to work on every single day if you want to be great in this game. Well, J-Mac, I know we went a little long here. You got to get to practice. We all do. Uh, really appreciate your time and looking forward to hearing the broadcast on Saturday. The the new look Bears team still Jeff and Tom, but J-Mac on the sidelines and can't wait to hear your observations and analysis from down there. So uh, appreciate it, J-Mac. No problem, guys. See you guys in a bit. Thanks for having me. Hey, our next partner is a really cool product. Let's talk about Athletic Greens. If you're looking to get better gut health, more energy, or a stronger immune system in a really easy, natural way, you've got to check out Athletic Greens. And I'm sure you all agree that most of us are not huge fans of having to take a bunch of pills or vitamins in the morning. But with Athletic Greens, you can get rid of all of those extra vitamin bottles and finally make some room in your cabinet. Athletic Greens is an all-in-one solution, and you'll really enjoy getting your daily vitamins. So what's in this stuff? Well, with one delicious scoop of Athletic Greens, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, and aging all the things. And right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition, especially heading into the flu and cold season, which is way too close. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash Adams. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash Adams to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. We all have busy lives these days. You can't afford to waste today stuck on the couch because of a few drinks the night before. Zbiotics is the answer we've all been looking for. Zbiotics pre-alcohol probiotics, the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. Here's how it works. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. It's this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. Zbiotics produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down. Designed to work like your liver, but in your gut, where you need it the most. Just remember to drink Zbiotic before drinking alcohol, drink responsibly, and get a good night's sleep to feel your best tomorrow. Every time I have Zbiotics before drinking, it makes such a difference the next day. Even after drinks the night before, I know I'll be able to move on to the next day's task with no setbacks, like covering the bears. Give Zbiotics a try for yourself. Go to zbiotics.com slash Adams get 15% off your first order when you use Adam at checkout. Zbiotics is back with 100% money back guarantee, so if you're unsatisfied for any reason, they refund your money, no questions asked. Remember to head to zbiotics.com slash Adam and use the code Adam at checkout for 15% off. Thank you for Zbiotics for sponsoring this episode. Hey, Hogan Johns would not be what it is without our producer, Kent Garrison. Shout out to Kent, always working tirelessly behind the scenes enabling this podcast to be what it is. And when every person, moment, and penny counts in your business, you can't afford to take any of them for granted. Stamps.com gets it because for the last 25 years, they've been helping businesses like yours save time and money. So you can focus on your business knowing Stamps.com has all your postage needs covered with premium discounts and great rates. Stamps.com is a post office in your office. With Stamps.com, all you need is a computer and a printer. They even send you a free scale so you'll have everything you need to get started. And if you need package pickup, you can easily schedule it through your Stamps.com dashboard. Running a business isn't cheap, especially when it comes to fulfilling orders for your customers. Luckily, Stamps.com has huge carrier discounts up to 84% off USPS and UPS rates. For 25 years, Stamps.com has been indispensable for over 1 million businesses. Set your business up for success when you get started with Stamps.com today. Sign up with promo code ADAMS for a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage 
and a free digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter code ADAMS. All right, John Z, well, that was a really fun conversation. I love getting into some of the old stories with him, uh, especially when it comes to special teams, obviously. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, he has one of my favorite highlights. I think it was in the NFC Championship game. Uh, one of the touchdowns that Thomas Jones scored in that game, Jason McKee takes out two players on that play, just playing fullback. Wipes out two guys. It's like a run inside the 10-yard line. You can go back and see the highlights. And uh, it's good having him now part of the – back in the. he's always been part of the Bears yeah. family, but now on the I, radio I, team. I love his stories. You mentioned special teams. He tells great ones about how players used to compete – like the starters would compete to be on the field with Devin Hester because they just wanted to be part of that excitement. Yeah, like and Charles how, Tillman. Yeah, Charles yeah. Tillman. And now like Dave Tobel pull these guys off and yell at them, but they'd still find their ways on the field because when you're playing with an all-time great, and they, they knew it at that point, and he was such a – it's magical seasons, right? They wanted to be on the field with him. So I, I like hearing those stories. He's got well, great well, stories. You about, want to be on those Hester highlights? Yeah, yeah, you do. Like if, I'm, if, you do. if I'm blocking on that Super Bowl – kickoff return i'm feeling pretty good about myself being on that highlight for the rest oh, of my life memory to have huh? that's crazy man man but there's there's so many you know he was on the field for a lot of those those highlight real touchdowns from master and whatnot but uh yeah I, I feel like he brings up a good point about the preseason because we haven't seen live action we haven't seen those five plays on the goal line. Maybe it's it's Thursday morning, 838 Thursday morning. Maybe we get that later, but I don't think we will. They're playing a preseason game in, in, in two days. No, I don't yeah. expect them to even have that long of a practice today after yesterday's. Yeah. Ye yesterday was one of those long padded practices. Yeah, and there's, there's too many, like, starters or, like, important contributors that are on the sideline right now. Jermaine Edmonds. Marcus Walker, Nate Davis, Chase Claypool, we saw in one on one drill pull up. Um, Equinemia St. Brown, we saw kind of roll his foot a little bit on, on a nice catch in seven, seven, seven on sevens. Um, like too many guys that are, that are going to be on the 53 man roster aren't like ready to play in this preseason game. But I still think guys like Darnell Wright, guys like Tevin Jenkins, Braxton Jones, they, I think they need some some live reps where they can finish some blocks really. And I think that'll help get them going throughout the rest of this camp and preseason. Yeah. Other than the obvious, which is Justin Fields and whatever he's able to do or not do on Saturday. To me, it's the offensive line. You know, I, I think one to be optimistic. I know you share this um, sentiment and I agree with you feel pretty confident about the Bears' ability to run the football. And that's kind of hard to gauge in some of these practices because they're not live. And so we might have seen some of these practices. Like yesterday was an example. Too many false starts, a couple holding penalties. Just kind of looks a little shaky. Um, but if you can get them in a game where they can run the football and start to get in rhythm running the ball, I think you might see better results overall. So I'm just excited to see how they come together, whoever's playing. Like, I don't think Nate Davis is going to be out there. Um, no. If you want to limit Cody Whitehair's reps, I think that's fair. I, I wouldn't sit him because he's the center, and he's, he. we've heard from these coaches about the cadences that they're uh, practicing with Justin Fields. Well, the center needs to be a huge part of that. So I, I don't think you can sit Cody Whitehair completely. But for the most part, I think you'll have four – Four of the five starters, hopefully, out there. And you got to see what they can do up front. I like what he said about Javon Dexter because Javon Dexter and even Zach Pickens, like they're not having the camps, at least maybe we thought they would have, like where, where you see like a bunch of flashes. You see, you've seen some good plays, but for the most part, I don't know, kind of quiet camps, right? Mm -hmm. I think quiet is a, is a good way to put it. Um, I never looked at it in, in that in that lens where, you know, where maybe they can't go full go or they're, they're still learning like when to pull back not to hurt my teammate, not when to, to go full out because it's not fully live. It may be like 90% or 75% live in some instances, but it's still not, 
as J Mac put it, like full goal. I'm gonna take this guy, throw him to the ground, and I'll go hit the quarterback. We haven't seen any of that. And I know the Bears like to think Javon Dexter has that as part of his game, but we can't really see that right now in these training camp practices. So that's like a good point that like as a former player that J Mac brought up for this show. Absolutely. Like even look, and you heard J Mac talk about the importance of these special teams reps for some of these guys just clinging to a roster, hoping to make a practice squad. Like even on these days where they have the longer padded practices, if you watch the special teams periods, a lot of it's at a slower pace because there's still, there's so many guys that you have to get, reps and, and under, yeah. understand the scheme it's just it's too chaotic to just go full go so really this is going to be their first opportunity on saturday to have a real live rep at full speed and those are the fastest reps because you're go, you got the whole field to work with uh with the football in the air for a long time um they, so i don't know anyone who says the preseason doesn't matter uh like i get it to a point and we certainly saw a few years ago when the covid year when the preseason got wiped out altogether. They adjusted pretty pretty well, but it's also unfair to just completely say that for the guys that are on the back end of the roster that are trying to make it because these reps really do matter. And I think for certain players on the first team, they matter too. Like, this matters yeah. for Darnell Wright. I want to see this guy actually play in, in a real game and see if things are better than we've sometimes seen, seen in practice so far. I'm almost what, like... I my opinion on preseason actually is kind of changing throughout this camp where I'm thinking it might matter more now with how training camps are set up where you have three days on one day off. Everything is so scripted in, in a sense. And you want to limit injuries. You want to limit some of the violent contact that is just naturally part of the sport, right? To, to limit injuries. That's what you want to do. Like, like, so we've seen Matt Nagy completely dismiss the preseason. He did these mock games. He tried to get thud a, a lot, but it never really came out, right? It never re really, like, they were never really a physical football team. And we know, like, Eberflus and what poles are building, like, they want to be. They're signs of it. Where now the preseason, like, those, that range of snaps that these starters are going to get are so important because instead of getting that five, live snaps in the goal line that you might get in a training camp practice, I'm going to give you 10 live snaps in a game. Go callous yourself that way against a different opponent that's not your teammate. So it almost feels like to me, maybe for Matt Eberflus, maybe we got to ask him this in, in, in a week or so, like maybe the preseason is a bit more important to him. I kind of lost my train of thought there. No, but yes. I got you, but <laughs> I'll, I'll pick up. I'll I'll pick you up here because you know who else it's important for just to get live reps, the coaching staff. Yeah, getting those headsets on, going through play calls, situations on the fly where you cannot script it. You you, you can't. You you could script the beginning of the game basically, but once you get in a real game situation, you know, and and it doesn't matter what's. You know, for us watching the game or even from the press box, it could be the fourth quarter of a preseason game and we could start writing our stories or whatever. Uh, for them, they got to coach to the end of the game. Yeah. They, they, they got to get all those reps in. They got to get all those players in. And it's all happening at a very fast pace. Those games go way faster than three hours in your head when you're out, down there on the field. Yeah. And, and I, one thing I – go ahead, because I was just going to say, I think that they – I like how much they try to simulate some of that stuff yes. in practice. It's, yes, yes. It's that, actually it's, pretty impressive. That's one noticeable difference. Even like, like they tried some of this last year, but I feel like at least yesterday's practice, it was full of it. Matty Rufus calls him like play it yep. periods or whatever. Like he was switching like as, as J Mac was, you know, telling everybody, like I, I take I try to take a lot of notes when Justin Fields is, is on. And it would go from like first and ten to like third and three. And there wasn't a play in there. There wasn't a second down in there. And like, you're wondering what's happening. But Maddie Bufflewis later explained that, like, that's a test for his coordinators where they got to think fast. They got to find the right play because the games can be hectic, man. Well, there's a lot of stuff going on. So, so this is one of the big reasons why, and I, and I get it, man. Some of these programs that have the offensive head coach paired with the quarterback, there's certainly examples where it's going well. But one of the big reasons why I am such a proponent and supporter of the idea of the CEO head coach is what we're seeing with Matt Eberflus right now. If you watch him during practice, he is just like the organizer who's just making sure everything is 
you know, he's calling sacks when they need to be called and he doesn't agree with a referee like holding the whistle too long or whatever. He's moving the football around. What he's doing is he's testing his coaches just as much as his players, especially in these sessions that you're talking about to play it because the, he's throwing all kinds of third down situations and a lot of it's just on the fly. You know, it's based on the flow of practice. If you're just the offensive head coach who's also the play caller, you're buried in your play sheet the whole time. You got everything scripted. You're just trying to run all these plays, and you're not necessarily thinking about it in the same way that, you know, a CEO-type head coach would, where he's got the time out there on the field to not be worrying about the next play call, just saying, I'm going to call. I'm, this is this down in distance. Now you figure it out. Now you come up with the right play call on your own. And it just, to me, it simulates real life football better if that makes sense yes he, he was well they're, they're not going to have like eight third downs in a row but I, I like the spontaneity of going third and two third and nine and at some point like in practice like i, I know the bears were like practicing their cadences in that messed up certain certain things up there mm -hmm. out there you know because they're trying to get everybody aligned but like at one point in practice i'm like I'm like, the officials are in on this. There's way too many flags being thrown <laughs> today, right? Like, there was just, it was almost like almost suspicious to me where he's in it. They're in it with Hebraflus, where like it, it's those situations where, oh, oh now we got a false start. We go from third and six now to third and 11. Yeah. You know, and, and, a, and a second there. And Luke Getz, he has to find a play and get it in the Justin Fields so he can scan the field and get everybody aligned, right? Like, I like that. There was a lot of that in Wednesday's practice. You know, there's a funny moment now that you bring that up where they call a false start, and I swear to God, no one moved. I'm, I'm telling you, they were in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and and the uh, and Getsy was over there like, who jumped? Who jumped? Who jumped? And Tyke Tolbert was over there like, who jumped? Who jumped? And like the referee didn't really have an answer. And yeah. then all of a sudden he goes, uh, 76. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. I'm telling you. Like, like just, there were some like there there at one case I felt like um St. Brown was like stating his case to the official. Like I didn't yeah. move, but yeah, like I, I believe there was well, but maybe Flus was just telling him, Hey, call this penalty. Yes. And he may have been the only one on the field who was telling the refs to do that just to test everybody on the field. Cause that shit's gonna happen on game day. Absolutely. You know, when you again when you go from a makeable third and four. To third and ten, that changes a lot of things. Yeah, it, it does. I I like seeing that. Yes. All right. Now we're in agreement. Now Hogan Johns with their conspiracy theories. We are in full belief that the officials like were this. in on it with Flus <laughs> at Wednesday's practice. I'm gonna try to get confirmation from these referees today. Yeah. Hey. hey how much on. is he paying you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like it though. I, the the situational and and you heard Richard Hightower the other day, um, unprompted just kind of go off on a tangent and praise Matt Eberflus for how detailed and really ahead of the game he is on the headset. Now, that's a story we're just going to have to take, you know, his word for it because that's something that other than seeing a lack of coaching mistakes on the field, you know, we'll never be able to confirm. We don't know what's really going on in the headset. But hearing an unprompted story like that from the special teams coordinator – I, I, that's one of the things I'm really interested in this season, to be honest with you, Johns, because the Bears were in a lot of close games last year, but I didn't come out of the season with any grand conclusions on Matt Eberflus, the situational head coach, if that makes sense. I don't know how many of those situations actually presented themselves, or it's possible that it was, for the most part, so clean that he might be really good at it. Yeah. What was the one example where he got the punt in the final, like, 90 seconds? Which game was that? Where the Giants he, game? What was the Giants game? Where they where, punted late and then they muffed it instead of going for it? No, no. They got the three and out to get the ball back with, like, oh yeah, very limited time. But he said that's what they hoped to get and planned to get, and they got it. I don't think it worked out for the Bears in terms of a win. What game was that? I vaguely remember what you're talking about. Someone I'm sure will tweet it at us after the show. Yeah. Um, but that was a successful situational, I don't know, his, his method worked just in terms of what he wanted to get. Well, and the whole thing that's hard even to gauge 
for us or fans is it's easy to second guess, but it's about the process first guessing, right? It's even if it didn't end up working out, it's did it make sense in the moment? Um, and again, you know, how was the communication on the headsets? And we've heard this. I mean, it sounds like Flus is always thinking ahead. And again, I don't, I don't mean to keep harping on this, but that's really hard to do when you are buried in a play call sheet the whole game, just thinking about the next play you're going to run. You got to really lean on your other assistants to be on top of that stuff. Um, and so I, I just really, I'm optimistic about the coaching aspect of it. Maybe we're still a little bit in the honeymoon phase here with this new regime, but, um, there, there's very little to criticize from my standpoint on how they're running practice, the situations that they're presenting. Um, we're certainly not getting any of this. What a waste of time training camp was, guys. <laughs> We're a long ways from that. Yes. To put it yes. that way, where it's yes. like, what are they doing? Why are they not giving this quarterback reps? What is happening? Why do they not practice the scramble drill? What is what's happening here? No, it's why are we very delaying little the inevitable? Of that. Yes, yes. Everything seems very. We said this last year, very purposeful, and I think last year was also. Like they went, they were a three win team because they had three win talent. Let's be honest. You know, you still need, you could have the best practices in the world. You still need good football players. And I think the, the roster has changed a bit and you see the upgrades. Like you can feel the upgrades. They're there across the board, both lines, the secondary, the quarterback looks better. The receivers are a lot better. You can see it. My son is laughing at something in the background. Like, oh, I can't hear him. Hear him. <laughs> Tell them to laugh louder. I'm going to tell coach the coaches at football practice later for a few more <laughs> sprints, wind sprints uh, yeah. in practice. Yeah, you keep bothering the podcast. You could run some extra suicides. I'm losing my chain of thought because he's laughing so hard over here. <laughs> uh, let me give you one more example, too, of just, like, weird things we used to see. Like, it always bothered me when Mark Trestman would not let the defensive line bat the ball down oh, at the line yeah. of scrimmage. Yeah, yeah. Like, come on, dude. You got to learn as a quarterback how to get around that. And then what do we see when the season started? Tip, tip, tip. Nothing. Yeah. And it's like, so again, there's there's been plenty of examples of the training camps we've covered in the past where we're standing there scratching our heads about something. And really, right now, all there's sometimes complain about is just some of the results from the players. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, well, this defensive line's batting the ball down. We've seen a bunch of it in, oh, some, yeah. in some team periods. My, my one. Vivid memory from the Mark Trustman era is how Martellus Bennett would catch a pass, I don't know, 7, 10, 12 yards down the field, and Trustman would run to him just to make sure that Martellus Bennett would run back to the huddle. Remember that? Yes, because Marty was the all-time, between the whistle, that dude was going 110%. But once that whistle was blown What's and the going? play was dead, he was at like negative 10%. Yeah. It was just. It would take him three reps to get back, back. Like and scrimmage. like in every rep counts in practice, and you, and you want to get as many plays in as you can, right? Like, like, that. like it, it took us a while to pick up on that too, right? Like two, three days of practice. Like, why is Mark Tressman running down twenty yards down the field? Mar Marty's always going to be one of my favorite players I ever covered. Covered, yeah. Just entertainment, good, bad, whatever stuff in the locker room. He said sometimes. It's great. Uh, so, all right. Well, I'm looking forward to this game Saturday. Um, I don't know. At least what's first, your, uh, half. before I say goodbye, what's your range on Justin Fields snaps? Last year against the Chiefs, he played 18 snaps. Yeah, I was going to say 10 to 15. I was going to say somewhere around 15. So I think that makes sense. It's and that's important to remember, guys. It's a snap count. It's not necessary necessarily a series count. If they go three and out, I would expect them to come out their first second series. If they go down there in twelve plays and have a nice touchdown scoring drive, he's out. Maybe that's it. Um. But yeah, I think that's about it. But I would keep some of those offensive linemen in there longer. I would play Darnell right maybe the whole first half. Wow. Guy needs reps, dude. Yeah. It's the NFL. You're in the NFL. And that's what one of my favorite things about the first preseason game, especially is just watching the rookies. 
whoever they are, they should get playing time. They need it. They're in a position, too, where I guess with maybe Darnell being a, a pretty big exception, but if they were to get hurt, it's not the end of the world. And I think you and I agree on this. Like our earliest impressions of this rookie class is that it's a good one. And I think I think seeing them in the preseason, and then, of course, the regular season will, will of course, cement that. But just in terms of what we're getting out of them at training camp, like, oh, there's some players that were selected by the Bears this year in the draft. Yeah, I think I I think the wide receiver talent has made the cornerbacks better. I think Jalen Johnson going against DJ Moore has that's been healthy. I think Tyreek Stevenson, whether he's going up against DJ Moore or hearing Chase Claypool incessantly yelling on his ass every. <laughs> Rep he's a taking. I mean, I think some of it's gone a little too far, but I, I it stood out to me yesterday that John Hoke, the DB's coach, didn't say anything to Claypool. Got to deal with it. You're gonna have guys like that on the field. You gotta you gotta learn to play through it, not fight back, not commit a penalty, not get frustrated. And actually, I thought Stevenson handled himself really, yeah. really well through all that. Yesterday. So just to clarify, what we're talking about Chase Claypool is chirping Tyreek Stevenson an awful lot. A lot, a lot. Even after he got hurt, after Claypool got hurt and he sat out the rest of practice, yeah, even he was when still he's not playing his ass the whole <laughs> practice. When he's not, yeah, yeah. Even when he's not playing around the field, he is on the rookie. All right. Now, I thought some of it crossed the line. You're a little bit more meatball football guy than uh, I am, to be honest. Well, I, I didn't mind it like when I was on the field. Yeah. But like when. When DJ Moore beat Stevenson in one rep, and and it wasn't Moore letting Stevenson know that he did it. It was Chase Claypool, who was like 15 yards away, very loudly, where yes. everybody could hear it. The media there, the the fans that were on the sideline at that point, like it was, it felt notable. And I, and I don't mind it at all if that's the way to, you know, to motivate each other back and forth. Maybe Stevenson, you know, maybe he has, maybe he's more quiet with this trash talk. Maybe he whispers it when he's like impressed man coverage or something, yeah. but it felt very notable. I mean, at that point I would have been like, dude, you're not even practicing anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Shut yeah. up. Stevenson <laughs> took it. Like he got beat by more. <laughs> yeah. But he didn't even get beat that bad. That's DJ Moore on like a seven yard out. Like that's not an easy stop for a rookie and it wasn't like he got beat for a 30 yard touchdown i want to say later in practice in seven on sevens he broke up it wasn't the same route but kind of similar in direction without me giving away things and i mean that was a big pass break up third down yeah well and rookie that was responded. notable to me because you didn't see him then chirping back at claypool because he made a play he just went yeah. back and did his business so but Back to the original point, I think all this has been really healthy for the DBs. And I think Tyreek Stevenson, with some of those especially first-week struggles he had, he's kind of battled through that. I'm, I'm high on him. I like this, yeah. and I can't wait to see him in the game on Saturday because, uh, you know, he might go up against... I don't necessarily... I haven't quite looked at who's completely healthy or not healthy for the Titans at this point, but Traylon Burks, the first-round wide receiver last year, who didn't really put up, you know, a huge rookie season, but... I, I, while I doubt we'll see much of DeAndre Hopkins, I would think if Burks is healthy, like that's a matchup that Tyreek Stevenson could go up against, and that could be fun to watch in this preseason game. So yeah, every rep is going to matter for him. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll uh, we'll have you all covered, uh, of course, with this preseason game, and uh, as training camp rolls on into Indianapolis next week, looking forward to that. Joint practices. Um, Hogan John's always having you covered here and re appreciate it. Uh, of course, theathletic.com slash Hogan John's for all the written coverage from The Athletic. And on CHGO, you can get my newsletter every morning. Um, I have, let's see, tomorrow I have three not-so-obvious players to watch Saturday for you in the newsletter. Kevin Fishbane has a fun article with Cody Whitehair on The Athletic today where he... They went through all the offensive linemen that Cody Whitehair has played with in his Bears career, which is a lot. Wow. And he gets every single one but one. So check it out. I want to know who he didn't get. Well, 
Click the link. I hope it's Rashad Coward. It is not. <laughs> My guy. I know what. All or right. Rashad Coward. I know. I think he's still in the league. Maybe. I don't know. Not sure. Uh, thanks to Jason McKee for jumping on. That was a really fun conversation. Hope everybody enjoyed it. Enjoy the game on Saturday. And um, we'll talk to you soon. See ya.